life as a person. You know, some people say these blessings are coming from God. This favor is coming from God. This opportunity is coming from God. We arise in actual sense. Such opportunities are not from God. telling you the sources of money. These are the people that control money. These are the people that are rich in the world. Welcome back. This is End Time Evangelist. God bless you. So, um, I'm making these videos in response to the questions that some of my followers are asking on whether the use of perfume is a sin or not. And probably whether the use of perfume is going to take one to hair fire. And uh, I will quickly, without wasting of your time, go into that. Because this is one of the things or one of the errors we have in the church today. One pastor is preaching one thing, another is preaching a different thing. The messages they are preaching in the Christian tradition today are not the same at all. And the message of Christ is supposed to be one because we are going to the same place if we are serving the same God. And I pray that the Lord God Almighty, by His Holy Spirit, will give you understanding of this message. In the name of Jesus, may the Lord open your eyes and give you the true meaning of the passages we are going to consider this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The issue of whether Christians should use perfume or not has been a long debate in the house of God. And I want to use this opportunity to talk about it. When you talk about people not using perfume or Christians not using perfume or whether the use of perfume as believers is by Blika, or whether it will take one to have five, or whether it is a sin. Um, to start with, <clears throat> let me start by the incident that happened, the, the generation, I mean, the, the, the genesis of uh, this perfume in the Bible. And you can find that in the book of Exodus, chapter 30. If you study the whole of Exodus, chapter 30, that passage is talking about uh, perfume. Where and when God was instructing Moses to make some sweet aromas for him, some incense, some you know sweet fragrances for him. And uh, when you read that passage very well, and you allow the Holy Spirit of God to give you the interpretation of that verse, what that passage or the whole of that chapter is saying it's not that a man should go and buy perfume at markets and begin to spray it on their bodies. It didn't say, or it doesn't say that Christians should begin to use perfume. That is not what that passage is saying. The first thing I'm going to do is to summarize this passage for you so that you can understand what God is trying to say. Everything that happened in the Old Testament was just a shadow of the New Testament church, of what we are living today. Everything that God did in the Old Testament was to prepare the New Testament church. What this is telling you, or what this is telling you, is that you cannot completely separate the Old Testament Bible from the New Testament. Because the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law. So we should understand and allow the Holy Spirit of God to give us the true interpretation of certain passages in the Bible. When you give him chance, he will give you more. But when you try to put in your own interpretation to any passages in the Bible, you will end up doing a big error. And such errors will lead people astray and deceive them. Now, Exodus chapter 30 from verse 34 to 38 specifically 
is where we are going to, you know, I'm going to derive my text. Okay. Excuse me. So we are going to consider this passage now and talk about it. So the number one thing that God is talking about in this passage is holiness. Holiness. Holiness of God. Holiness of God. Holiness is the nature of God. Righteousness is the act of God. God was telling Moses in Exodus chapter 30 from verse 34, specifically, the kind of incense, fragrance, the kind of perfume, good smelling aroma he should make for him. He should make for him. And when, I, I, I know one of the errors that you see in some churches like uh, uh, all these white garment churches and the Roman Catholic church, they begin to burn incense and candles, but they don't know the meaning of burning incense and candles. They don't understand the spiritual significance of what this passage is saying. Because this passage here is not talking about you physically in this last generation of the last dispensation of the last revival that is going to happen on the face of the earth. God is not saying that you should burn incense because we are the last generation that are going to fulfill the New Testament you know, uh, uh, doctrines that Jesus has given to the church. And if we must achieve this, we have to come together and teach the Bible the way that the Bible is. The way that Jesus has given us the Bible. And not trying to interpret the Bible to suit ourselves. No. One point you need to derive from this passage is the holiness of God. God was telling Moses, make it holy. This kind of perfume, this kind of aromas, he mentioned a lot of you know, fragrances in that, in, in that passage. And he said, make it holy. Make it holy. No one else should do anything like unto it that is, that is like it he said make it holy so one thing that this place is talking about is the holiness of god if you go to the book of first peter chapter 1 from verse 15 to verse 16 he's talking about the holiness of god be ye holy for i am holy be ye holy in your conversation be ye holy in your behavior be ye holy in your attitude in your talk be ye holy in your services in your relationship with God, in your relationship with your brother, in your relationship with your sister, in your relationship with your mother, in your relationship with your fellow brethren in church. Be holy, for God is holy. That passage is talking about holiness of God. That is one. Another thing you need to derive from this passage is that it's talking about separation. Separation unto God. Separation unto God. That is why I am telling you that this passage is, is talking about the New Testament in Advent, in Advent of the New Testament, before the New Testament church appeared, even before the coming of Jesus. The passage was preparing the New Testament church. It's talking about separation. As a Christian, you need to separate yourself out of the world unto God. That's why the Bible said in the book of 2 Corinthians, from verse 14 that he said be not unequally yoked with unbeliever he said because the house of god has nothing to do with idols separate yourself unto god as a child of god separation separation he said make this perfume a, pecu a peculiar one a special one unto me separate it unto me separation remember before samson was born an angel appeared to his mother before he was born and told the mother that she should not take alcoholic drink she should not take anything unclean because she was going to give birth to a savior she was going to give birth to a special child who would deliver the Israelites from the hands of the Philistines their enemies do not take anything that will pollute the baby Jesus told the angel told the mother of Samson which means that God was telling her that your child will be separated unto me. That's why he didn't want the mother to take anything that will contaminate the child when she, is, she was conceived of Samson. Separation unto God. If you also go to the book of uh, Numbers chapter 6 from verse 3 down, God was talking about separation there to the priest. So this passage here is telling you that as a child of God, you should separate yourself from the world and, and unto God. 
Second Corinthians chapter 6 from verse 17, he's saying that you should not touch unclean things. You should come out of, out of them and separate yourself. Be ye separated and I will receive you. This passage here is talking about separation. That is two. Another thing you need to understand in this passage is that it is talking about prayer. Access to God through prayer. Access to God through prayer. If you go to the book of uh, Revelation chapter 5 from verse 8 or so, the Bible is explaining in that passage that the prayer of the saints, the prayers of the children of God, all the prayers were offered to God. They are sent to God to heaven in form of flames. That is in form of incense, burnt incense with good aromas. Our prayers are sent to God in form of aromas. If you connect it spiritually, connecting to that uh, Exodus chapter 30 from verse 34 to 38, he's talking about access to God through prayer. Access to God through prayer. Because in the olden days, the children of Israel, Moses and the rest of them, when they born incense, the incense they burned, you know, stand, stood as their prayer, the prayers they offer to God. When God received the good aroma of the incense, that is, God became happy. God accepted it as their offer of prayer. So if you now go to the Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 8 again, Revelation chapter 8, if you start to read from verse 4 down or 3 or so, it's also talking about the prayers of the saints ascending to God in form of incense and flame. That passage in Exodus 30 from verse 34 to 38 is talking about uh, uh, access to God in prayer. Access to God in prayer. I've mentioned one to you. I said first, he's talking about holiness. And I quoted to you um, 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16. Second point, I said he's talking about separation unto God. As a Christian, separate yourself unto God. Third point, access to God through prayer. Access to God through prayer. And now, God wanted Moses to separate the, you know, sacred from the ordinary. You know, when something is sacred, unto God, he has to be kept holy and righteous. He has to be kept separate. You know, another thing you need to understand in this passage is that this passage is talking about intercession. Intercession. He's telling, he was telling us ahead of time before Jesus came that Jesus Christ is interceding for us. If you go to the book of Hebrews chapter 7 from verse 25, he's talking about intercession. This passage here is talking about intercession. Intercession, intercession, intercession. Do you understand? That is one of the things that this passage is talking about. Another thing you need to consider or derive from this passage is purity. Purity. If you go to the book of uh, Proverbs chapter 4, uh, verse 23, you see uh, Proverbs 4, verse 23 or so, it's talking about our heart. He said that our heart is the issue of our life. We should guide the diligence with diligence. Because the heart of man is the engine of his body. The heart of man is very, very important. You need to guide your heart. If you like, you take the message is the truth. Because Bible has said that those that wear trousers are abomination unto him. As long as they are female. Trousers are men for men. Trousers are men for men. Short bombs are men for men. Knickers are men for men. Any woman that is wearing knicker or trousers are going to hellfire. And they ask me a question. They say, what of those white people that live abroad? That in their churches, they don't cover their hair and they wear trousers and they wear jewelries and God is moving. Are they going to go to hell when they die? Yes! The Bible says in the book of Psalm, chapter 9, verse 17, it says, The wicked shall be turned into a hell, and all the nations that forget God. It means they have forgotten God. Who made them? When you forget God, you have abandoned His word. You have abandoned His will. You are going your own way, and you don't want to do the will of God. And as many ministers, and as many people that have refused to listen to this truth, and accept it as it is wrong. So this passage is talking about the purity of heart. 
as a child of God, you should have a heart of purity. If you go to the book of Matthew chapter 15 from verse 18 down where he's talking about the heart. He said that what defy a man comes from their heart. Bible begins to mention a lot of things that defy the heart of man in, the, in that passage. So the heart of man is very delicate. We need to guide it. We need to protect it. We need to be cautious of what we think, of what we harbor in our heart. Because God wants our heart to be very pure. Purity of heart. If you go to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 7, from verse 1, the Bible is talking about the purity of heart. Internal holiness and external holiness. So God wants us as children of God to have a heart of purity. So everything that God told Moses to do in this passage, uh, every, uh, what I'm telling you right now. So if you if you read the, this passage and allow God to interpret this passage to you, you equally consent and concur that what I'm telling you is the real meaning of this passage. It's not talking about you going on and begin to use perfume on your body. Jesus Christ is your perfume. Jesus Christ is your fragrance. Jesus Christ should be the good aroma that you should spray. If you go to the book of uh, Matthew chapter 5 from the 13th down, he's talking about you being a light to the world and being a salt to the world. So you should allow Jesus Christ to be your fragrance, to be your perfume. Because the Bible says that Jesus gave himself as a sacrifice. In the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 1 and 2, Jesus gave himself as a sacrifice which has become a sweet-smelling savour to every believer in Christ Jesus. If Jesus Christ is your sweet-smelling savour, he is expected of you also to be his sweet-smelling savour because Jesus is your husband and you and I are his wives. So you should be a good aroma to Jesus Christ as much as he is equally a good fragrance, a good-smelling savour, a sweet-smelling savour unto you. You are expected to reciprocate that same good fragrance that Jesus has given to you. So that passage is talking about, um, you know, purity of heart. That is another point I'm giving you. Again, like I said, Jesus has given himself as a sacrifice, which is now a good smelling savour. The good smelling savour that Jesus is producing, producing today, every Christian and even non-believers are enjoying it. Most especially believers. Because when you give your life to Jesus Christ, He gives you salvation. He gives you, he gives you the ticket to heaven. You become a born-again child of God. You have the joy of salvation. He gives you the Holy Spirit. He gives you the gift of healing. The gift of power to be able to minister and witness Him to people. And He accompanies you with His power. He provides for you. He keeps you safe. He protects you. Anything you ask Him, He does. The death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary has produced a lot of good fragrances that everybody is enjoying. So you are expected to reciprocate this good fragrance by being one unto him. One, being sweet to the world, being a source to the world, being a light to the world, being a Bible that people will study and say, Wow, I want to follow Jesus Christ because of your life. Let this life of Christ be the, the perfume you spread on your body. Let the good Christian living, good character, good behavior, let good attitude inculcating the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit in your life. Having the life, kind, a kind life of Jesus Christ in you as a Christian, let it be the good aroma. Let it be the perfume you spray on your body. Because Jesus Christ is our fragrance. And we are his good aroma. So don't go on and begin to buy perfume and spray because you saw perfume in the Bible, which you don't understand the meaning because you end up being destroyed. The Bible says, My people perish for lack of knowledge. So I'm by God's grace, I'm trying to explain this passage and also tell you honestly and truthfully that as a Christian, you should not use perfume. Another thing that this passage is talking about is atonement. Atonement for sin. Atonement for sin. Like I, I mentioned the uh, Ephesians chapter 5, 1 to 2 before. Atonement for sin. Jesus gave himself for the sacrifices of our sin. 
if you go to the book of John chapter 1 verse 29, the Bible says that Jesus Christ died for the whole world. He said, Behold the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world. He is a sacrifice for sin, for human sin, for your sin, for my sin, for the sins of people who are yet to come to him. He died and he, is, he was used as a sacrifice for our sin. The passage is talking about atonement for our sins. Atonement for our sins. If Jesus did not die today, you and I, where would we have been? We would have perished, we would have long, long perished. But that passage was for telling us the shadow of the future, what was going to happen in the future, how Jesus Christ will come, how he would die and become a sacrifice for our sin. So that passage is talking about the atonement for our sin, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ dying on the cross of Calvary to save the whole world. If you go to the book of 1 John chapter 2, from verse 2, it's telling us that he became the, pre -pre -pre the propitiation for our sins, and not just us, but the whole world, the sins of the whole world. He died for everyone. So this passage is talking about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary to save humanity. Another thing I want you to notice here, which might be the, uh, the last but not the least, is perfection. This passage is talking about perfection. God told Moses in the book of Genesis chapter 17 from verse 1, he said, he said Walk before me and be thou perfect. God also told Moses, I mean, sorry, God told Abraham, Abraham before he became Abraham, he was, he, his name then was Abraham. He told Abraham, to walk before him and be perfect. Genesis 17 verse 1. Genesis chapter 17 verse 1. God also told Moses in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 13. He said, be thou perfect. Be thou perfect. Be perfect before me. That means as a child of God, we need to live a perfect life, excellent life, a life that Jesus will recommend. A life that Jesus will be happy with. A life that will resemble the life of Christ. A perfect Christian living. That is what that passage is saying. If you, Jesus Christ, when he was on earth during his ministry, he told the disciples, which also refers to, refers to us, because we are now his disciples. He told them. In the book of Matthew chapter 5, from verse 48, he said, Be perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. So this passage is talking about perfection. So I don't know if, there, if, there, if there's any minister or any man of God that is telling their members that they, uh, they should use perfume. Because Moses say, uh, you don't make any other perfume that is like unto this one. So they might derive in a, under assumption that one can actually make a perfume and begin to use it. Or one can actually go to market and buy perfume and begin to use it. No, it is wrong. You shouldn't use perfume as a Christian. You shouldn't use perfume as a child of God because it is going to send you to hellfire. That is the truth. Use of perfume by Christians is a sin. If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, it's talking about perfection. He said, Having therefore all these promises daily below. He said, He said, Cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So this passage all together is talking about all the points I mentioned before you. Let me come again. This passage is talking about one, holiness. It's talking about separation unto God. It's talking about access to God through prayer. This passage is talking about uh, um, intercession. Jesus Christ intercedes for us. And I've been able to give you some Bible verses as regards, you know, in, in effect to that. And again, this passage is talking about atonement. Atonement. It's talking about purity. And then it's talking about perfection. And then let me also address some passage in the Bible that uh, some preachers may quote. You know, Mary Magdalene, when Jesus was on earth, I think they are, uh, John uh, had, you know, recorded the account. Mark recorded the account. And then Matthew recorded the account. The book of Matthew, the book of Mark, and the book of John. I think John chapter 12 from verse 1 to verse 8. And uh, that passage is talking about Mary Magdalene anointing Jesus' feet with expensive perfume. Matthew chapter 26 from verse, you know, I think 6 to 13 also has the record. And the book of Mark chapter 14 from verse 3 to 9 also had the account. 
when Mary Magdalene anointed the feet of Jesus Christ has its own spiritual significance. We should, you know, calm down sometime to meditate on passages to, you know, understand what the passage is trying to say. And if you remember very well, Mary Magdalene anointed the, the feet of Jesus Christ before his death. For Jesus, excuse me, Jesus told his disciples that he was going to die. Uh, they will arrest him, they will betray him, he, he will die after three days, he will rise again. So, the, let me tell you the meaning of Mary's anointing the feet of Jesus Christ. One, that place is talking about Mary's total devotion. Total devotion and love for Jesus Christ. Her love, her, her sincere love and total devotion for Jesus Christ. That is one meaning of that verse. She loved Jesus so much. What else could she have done? Jesus had given her salvation, had given so many other people salvation out of joy, out of love, out of happiness, out of the joy of salvation in her heart. Having become born again, having come across Christ and having received salvation, she was joyous and she was loving, she loved Christ, she was loyal to him, she was devoted to him and she decided to give the oil, to anoint the feet of Jesus Christ out of love and devotion, loyalty, submissiveness. She did that. That is number one meaning of that passage. Two, that passage is talking about the preparation for the burial of Jesus Christ. The oil that you know Mary Magdalene anointed Jesus Christ's feet is talking about it, uh, the preparation for his burial, the, it, of which the Bible you know calls it the the, the the spike nut or nut or something like that is the preparation for the burial of Jesus. Jesus himself said it. He opened his mouth and said that this oil was to prepare for his burial. Another meaning of that verse. He's talking about the, co the, 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 the cost of discipleship. The cost of discipleship. If you are following Jesus Christ, you have to sacrifice one thing or the other. You have to sacrifice either your family, either your job, either your certificate, either your children, either your husband, your wife. You have to sacrifice. That's why the Bible says that if you love your children more than me, if you love your husband more than me, if you love your wife more than me, you say you are not worthy to become my disciple. So Mary, what she gave Jesus was all she had. And she gave it as the only cost she can, you know, sacrifice following Jesus Christ. As Christian, what have you given to Jesus Christ? What have you sacrificed to Jesus Christ as a believer in Christ Jesus? You need to pay some sacrifices that will, you know, take something out of you that will make you feel feel the pain that you have really given to God. What uh, Mary Magdalene gave to Jesus Christ was known as the cost of discipleship. The cost of discipleship. You might not understand it that way, but that is what that passage is talking about. It's not saying that a Christian should go ahead and begin to buy the film and spray on their body. It's just like you telling believers to go on and begin to drink alcohol. I'm still going to make a video about that. So that passage is not talking about Christians going on and begin to spray perfume on their body. Okay? It's talking about the cost of the sacrifice. If you're following Jesus Christ, you have to pay some sacrifices that will really, you know, hit you as a child of God. What did I say here? The passage in Matthew chapter 26 from verse 6 to 13 and John chapter 12 from verse 1 to verse 8, the account whereby Mary Magdalene anointed the feet of Jesus Christ is talking about devotion of Mary's, uh, uh, Mary's devotion and love to Jesus Christ, the preparation for the burial of Jesus Christ, is talking about the cause of discipleship. And lastly, that passage contrasts Judas' betrayer of Jesus Christ. Remember, it was Judas that was saying, This oil that you are pouring. You know, is, is it not better we will sell it and use the money to help the poor? And Jesus said that you poor you have always with you. But me, I will not be with you all the time. So so Judas is Carlos was after the money, after the post, you know, but he didn't care about about the, the meaning of what uh, Mary Magdalene did. So Judas was a betrayer, but Mary decided not to be a betrayer of Jesus Christ, but a loyal one, a devoted one. 
who truly love Jesus Christ. So many believers today, just like Judas Iscariot, had betrayed Jesus. Many ministers had betrayed Jesus. But this sister refused to betray Jesus Christ. She gave all she had. What have you given to God as a Christian? That is what that passage is saying. So I hope that this video is clear to you and also it clears the doubts on your mind and the questions you are asking about whether perfume is a sin. Yes, it's a sin for believers. Believers in Christ Jesus who bears the image of Christ should not spray perfume on their body. It is going to take you to hellfire. It is a sin that will take you to hellfire without an eye blink. And I believe you accept this message and walk by it. As you do so, the Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Please, before you go, don't forget to subscribe on this channel. Sus subscribe one, like the video two, comment on the video, and most of all, share it to your loved ones so that they get to hear the truth that you're hearing. I promise that on this channel, by the grace of God, I will tell you the truth and I will reveal all the truth you need to know to help you make heaven on this channel. And as you obey, the Lord bless you. See you in my next video.